All right, it is a snowy Sunday afternoon, and it's time for the Speed Skating Video Podcast. All right, my guest today is a guy that uh, seems like he's been in the sport for decades, um, and he's not even close to 30 years old yet, which is which is crazy. Um, Near as I can tell, he still holds the junior national record in the 5K and the 10K, and he's part of a Team Pursuit uh, world record as well with the U.S., uh, all the way from Salt Lake, Mr. Emery Lehman. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me. Thank you for making the time. Uh, when are you heading to Europe again? Uh, we're leaving here in five days. We leave on Friday. Gotcha. So twice in Poland and then will you stay in Europe all the way into uh, world yeah we're gonna do two weeks in Poland for World Cup 5 and World Cup 6 and then we go straight to the Netherlands and we're there for two weeks through world championships gotcha okay do you have uh, do you have a idea of what you will be doing at worlds yet is that clear for you um, right now I'm on the bubble for the 1500 and we're almost certainly in for the team pursuit okay um any hopes for 5k at this point <clears throat> um i struggled really early on in the year so i think there's not really no there's no hope for the 5k okay. <laughs> understood yeah you and i talked about that a little bit um so as we often do on the channel here we're you know, we're, we're always curious to see how people wander into this sport. And I think your story is another one that's kind of unique. Um, you know, you were a, a typical Northern Illinois hockey player. And uh, is it true you saw a poster that said, try speed skating because it'll make you a faster hockey player? <laughs> Actually, my mom saw it. But yeah, that, that part <laughs> is true, which is why I think uh, U.S. speed skating should start doing that again. Um, cause I saw it, I was, I used to play hockey all the time at the Franklin park rink in Illinois before I started speed skating there. And that's where we saw the flyer. And that's where my mom, uh, dragged me crying to my first practice. So I guess, you know, take us through those early years. <laughs> well, it was, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago because now all we do is train and speed skate. Uh, whereas back then, you know, I was playing baseball i was playing lacrosse hockey and then i just started short track so and i even think i was doing judo for a short period of time in there so my brother and i did as many sports as we could and as we got older we kind of veered towards different sports um and speed skating hockey and lacrosse were like the three that i really stuck with um but when i was yeah when i was in high school and those like early days of of training i I remember I would be skating like twice a night, like two different sports a night, uh, like five, six days a week. So I remember like in high school and middle school, <clears throat> my schedule was Mondays. My mom would drive me an hour and 45 minutes up to the Pettit. We'd skate long track. And then she'd drive me down to Northbrook, Illinois, and I'd skate short track and then back home. Tuesdays, I'd go to Franklin Park, skate short track. And I'd go back to Oak Park, play hockey. <clears throat> Wednesdays, I uh, drive up to the Pettit, skate long track, and drive back down to Illinois and play ho have hockey practice. Thursdays, I did short track in Glen Ellen, and then I did uh, Thursday night hockey in Oak Park. And then Fridays, I usually spent doing race prep up at the Pettit Center. Saturdays, I uh, skated time trials and then had a hockey game, usually Saturday night and Sunday. So I was quite busy back then. I didn't, I didn't hear a rest day in there anywhere. No, I think uh, when I was that young, I didn't. Apparently, I didn't need one. So, so I've grown soft in my old age. So, I would say that, you know, when when I immediately think about guys that I know that are hockey players that switch to speed skating, I, I would think the majority of them are sprinters. Um, how long did you have to spend on long track before it became apparent that you were pretty damn good at going long distance? Um, I'm not sure how long it took. Um, I think because of all the sports I played, I kind of just was in really good shape and kind of had, you know, an engine back then. Uh, and so I linked up with a coach who was 
a distance skater himself and who I think kind of uh, edged me more towards the distance races while still making me skate everything. And so I think as much as it was me being good at them, I was also, I think, trained a little bit more towards that. Gotcha. So, you know, I, when I do the prep for these things, I, I really like to go into speed skating results and I'll grab a distance and I'll look at it, you know, historically. And one of the things that jumped out on me um, right away was back in December of 2010, I think you were around 14 years old, you did a, a 5K with no pair and you did a 721. Um, like to me, that's just, that's stunning because, you know, you were like most kids, your first 500 was a 52 or something. And how do you, get, how the hell do you go out and do a 721 by yourself? Your first, like, did you realize how good that was at the time? Um, I guess I didn't realize how great that was. Cause at that young age, you know, we mainly skated three K's. And so I knew my 3K was kind of getting there, but I wasn't really totally aware of what a good 5K was until uh, maybe the following year, I think I got down to like a 655 or maybe that same year. Yeah, I think I later 14. that same year you broke seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, so then at Junior Nationals, I skated a 655 and won it, um, which I – kind of then was like, okay, well, that had to have been a good time because, you know, you see the fix up there and you're like, okay, that's got to be good. Well, an another thing that really hit me is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like scanning through 5Ks just to as a point of reference. And I'm like, oh, Junior Worlds, Junior Worlds, Junior Worlds. <laughs> like how many, like, do you hold the record for most Junior Worlds appearances? I mean... Is, is five um, a lot or am I over-dramatizing that? Yeah, I think five's a lot. Um, you know, I was fortunate enough to go through, I think a lot of skaters go through like a spurt of where they really, you know, see a fast rate of improvement. And some people see that in their 20s. Some people see that in like their late teens. And I was just kind of fortunate enough to see that when I was 14, 15, yeah. you know, like in that earlier teens so, yeah, it's a lot of junior worlds. Um, I think looking back on it, I probably would have been, I mean, at the time it meant the world to me, but I think looking back on it, you know, going to fewer made it, made it more, would have, you know, made it more special and put a little bit less pressure on myself. But, uh, yeah, still going to five. It was, it was a lot of fun. Met a lot of really good people, which I is one of my favorite parts of skating. Yeah. Well, you, you just touched on something that I wanted to talk about because, um, you know, rapid rate of improvement at a young age in a, in a sport that's relatively small. Um, so all of a sudden out of nowhere, you become, you know, you become extremely relevant in a hurry. And of course, unfortunately with that is going to come a, a ton of expectation, um, how did you find yourself navigating, I don't want to say hype, but, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of people that just wanted a piece of you and wanted to talk to you and work with you or whatever. I mean, how did you, did you navigate that on your own or what was your support structure like? Yeah, well, my parents and my coach at the time were really good with that. Um, I don't know if there's as much hype and as much uh, people wanting a piece of me as you may think as probably say Jordan may have right now mm -hmm. but it was definitely you know like did a lot of sports and a lot of my best friends were in the sport you know were not seeing that fast rate of improvement so I knew how fragile that could be and especially you know a few Olympic quads later between Sochi and Korea and then again uh even like this past season like I know how fragile the success in the sport can be so it's definitely something that can never be taken for granted. So um, I probably took it for granted a little more when I was younger, but not not now. Yeah. Um, all right, here's a quiz. So you said that, you know, you, you can kind of remember some of the, the Junior Worlds appearances. So um, here's another thing that really <laughs> jumped out at me. So 2014, 
uh, 5K. Uh, do you remember the podium? Uh, it was me. Andrea Giovannini was on there. And then I think there was a Korean, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think there were any Dutch or Norwegians on the podium. Actually, I, I, if I read it correctly, it was Nils Vanderpool and Patrick Roost. Oh, wait, what what year? 2014. 2014, that was in uh, Poland. Yeah, and... Or, and no, that was in uh, Bune. So when I was looking at it, it looked to me like 2014 and 2015, it was you, Nils, and Patrick in both of them. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was thinking of uh, Italy uh 2013 but yeah 2014 it was uh yeah it was neil's on top then patrick then myself and then the 1500 podium in 2015 was patrick minsook and then i was in third Remember that. how does that make you feel <laughs> it's pretty cool i mean it's really good company to be in obviously um I think those junior worlds are, you know, where I was not seeing my greatest exponential rate of growth and they were on the upswing and I wasn't. So, um, and they've kept going up since then. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, I, I think you touched on something that's really interesting and important that I've learned um, since I've gotten into the sport and kind of started studying it is just how you use the word fragile before. And I think that's spot on, um, you know, you can be just in it and skating well, and you know, whether it's a summer break or maybe a short injury or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, it's just not there. Um, it, how, how many, how many of those, uh, ebbs and flows do you think you've navigated your way through now? Do you have any I idea? Think yeah i think now i'm coming uh i think right now i'm currently going through my third really big uh coming hopefully out of my third really big downswing here so i uh i've been through quite a few they don't, they never stop i guess yeah but as as it relates to emory lehman um you know circa 2023 i would say that you know maybe your personal individual game is is struggling or i think you had some health issues but uh is it safe to say team pursuit has never been better yeah no the team pursuit has been great um i'd say the early half of the year that was more of a testament to how strong ethan and casey were skating um and obviously you know the, the team is only as, as strong as their weakest link and unfortunately in the fall that was me but um yeah as a team we've been doing really well and we train and practice that a lot so it's nice to see that still doing quite well yeah oh i'll say um another thing that you know that i just pulled out of the the archives here uh when you were 16 you were the youngest ever to break 630 um was was that a statistic that slapped you in the face did somebody pull you aside and say hey by the way or is that or were you even aware of that i was not aware of that okay <laughs> So well, that is, that's pretty cool statistic to see. Yeah. Just, a, just another thing from the, the annals of, of, uh, Emery's, uh, growth in the sport. Yeah. So take us through the, the path to your first Olympics and then just that experience as a whole. I mean, I think almost everybody that I talk to that's, that's made it to a games, you know, has always had some really interesting perspectives on, on how different it can be than just say a, a typical world cup stop. So br bring us back to that time. Yeah, it was actually, it's much different than it is now. Cause obviously I was much younger, but it was also different because, you know, usually four years out, people are training. Like I want to make the next Olympic team. And when I was 13, I watched the Vancouver Olympics and I, you know, I watched the team pursuit guys win a medal and Apollo and JR win their medals and our women's short track team win their medal. So I was definitely in the sport, <clears throat> but at the age of 13, I definitely wasn't thinking like I could be on the next Olympic team, but you know, times change. And as I got to training and I hit my, you know, my improvement 
pretty quickly when I was like 14, 15, 16. And then so <clears throat> it actually was a lot less pressure than it is now because it wasn't, you know, the whole time I wasn't thinking like I could be at the Olympics, I could be at the Olympics. It was more so like once I made the team, I was like, holy, you know, like, holy cow, like I can't believe that I made this team. And it kind of happened so quickly and it was so such a surprise, I guess like not really any pressure just having been 17. Like I knew if I didn't make it, you know, my, hopefully my better years were ahead of me. Um, so it was much different than it is now. And then the year before I actually hit like a really bad, like <clears throat> the summer before I got a, uh, so the spring of 2013, I got a bone bruise in my ankle playing lacrosse. So for like two or three months there, I wasn't really able to do anything but swim because that was the only aerobic thing I could do that would not hurt the, the bone bruise in my ankle. And so I thought, you know, that was going to set me back a lot, but you know, it somehow powered through, kept my head down and kept skating fast. So you make the team and, and you go with, and, and when you think back at that team, um, you know, I think about, I mean, the the event itself was disappointing, obviously, but when you look at the, the roster of, of skaters, I mean, just, you know, legendary uh, U.S. speed skaters, real stalwarts of, of the sport, and then you. <laughs> yeah. Um, how, how were you received as a teammate? Uh, everyone was really nice to me. I was kind of like the young kid on the team, but... It was definitely uh, surreal, I would say, being with, like, that many people that were that good at the sport. You know, like, pretty much everyone on that team had a World Cup medal or World Championship medal, you know, whatever it was. Um, everyone on that team was a really good skater. Um, and then there was me. So it was a lot of fun. It was cool. It definitely set the standard high. It was definitely a shock with, you know, how everything went down in Sochi. But at the same time, it was just like such an honor to be on a team with those people. And uh, it's weird now because, you know, I'm on one of the, the older half of the World Cup team and even the last Olympic team, I think I was on the older half, which is weird because, you know, eight short years ago, I was like the youngest out of everyone. <laughs> yeah. And you're like I said before, I mean, you're you're not even scaring your 30th birthday yet, Yeah, which is really strange. <laughs> I know, I know. So at, at the time, I mean, you, you mentioned before, you know, maybe I was taking things for granted or it, it certainly wasn't intentional, I'm sure. But at that point in time, I mean, did it feel easy? Like, oh, geez, well, I'll just do as many of these as I feel like and then I'll leave the sport when I feel like it. I mean, how how, how were you feeling at that point in terms of your position in the sport? Yeah, you know, I just kind of wanted to surmind myself as a really good skater so <clears throat> believe it or not at that time skating at the olympics was big for me but also you know i was more concerned about niels and patrick at junior worlds and in norway two weeks after uh the olympics because i knew you know while skating at the olympics was great and it was f a phenomenal experience you know i didn't really see myself on the podium i don't think sure. anyone else did either um so for me the I had bigger fish to fry at juniors and try and compete, uh, try and compete there. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It, it, it is a weird sport in that way where, you know, you're, I mean, some people go to their first Olympic games before they do their first world cup. Uh, Aaron Jackson, as an example, it's just, it's a, a strange series of events once in a while, but yeah, no, it's definitely strange. I think I've been to <clears throat> more Olympics than I have world single distance or world all round championships, hmm. which is kind of an odd, odd thing if you think about it. <laughs> so the 14 games come and go and you're still young and you're still in the sport. What, what was that next quad like for you? What was, what was happening mm -hmm. in your life? Uh, so after Sochi, I enrolled at Marquette University in uh, Wisconsin. So it was my first time moving away from home. Um, continued to train, but it was just much tougher. Um, you know, I went to Marquette and 
tried to be, you know, have a, I'm a very social guy. I tried to have a social life, tried to, you know, get as much schooling as I could done. Um, but then at the same time, you know, I was, had a slide board in my room and was running the steps in my dorm, which was like 15 stories, um, which is like, it was really hot. And so I'd <clears throat> wake up before my 8 a.m. classes and be running the steps or doing slide board and going to class all day. And then, uh, you know, heading to the rink afterwards. Uh, so it was really tough because, you know, where most people in college are going to class, doing their homework, whatever, and then seeing their friends, you know, I had to spend more of that time at the rink. Um, and then the time that I should have spent recovering and, you know, resting, I was spending with my friends. Hmm. So it definitely was burning the candle at both ends there. And to the point where I ended up getting uh, mono, which really set me off. That was the second time I got it. And it really took me like two or three years to like bounce back from that. Cause I just went through like a real big, like, stage of like okay well you know i'd show up to the rink and i'm like i'm ready to train i'm ready to, you know finish the workout and i'd step out and do like one lap and just like i just knew like today wasn't the day i was going to do it mm. and then there were other days where i was like tired and then i'd step on the ice and somehow miraculously make it through the workout so it was just more so not really knowing what was going to happen how i was going to feel if i was going to be able to get it done and that really took a toll mentally, just like going through that for, you know, two, two seasons. Were there moments during that time where you just said, wow, I, I think maybe this just needs to go out of my life. And yeah, there were a lot then there've been a lot this season. Those, those thoughts are always in your head. So it's, uh, it's really tough, but, um, kind of got to keep your head down and keep working and adjust accordingly. And I've always seemed to come out of them, uh, you know, strong. So it, uh, you know, I ended up qualifying for the team, not having a great Olympics, but for me, making the team was kind of a surprise or miracle enough just because of how I was skating a year or two prior to that Olympics. I was like, there's no way in hell I'm going to be able to, you know, make it there. So, so where was your head after the 18 games? Um, Cause clearly, I mean, you still haven't left the sport, at least not officially. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, what, what were the next steps for you after Korea? After Korea, I uh, decided that I needed, I <clears throat> kind of took a summer off from training full time. I still rode the bike. I still did dry land, still, you know, played pickup hockey games, but not so just stuff to like maintain being in shape and not completely lose it. But and not, nothing to like, you know, would not be competition ready at all. Uh, and then in the fall and spring, I decided to play club hockey at Marquette, you know, try and get another full year of school done to try and close that chapter of my life out. Um, and then I just showed up to the rink, you know, once or twice a week just to skate with ASE, my team, and, you know, just not completely lose touch of my feel on the ice. And I think that was, that was really good because it, uh, it gave me a year off from the stress of competition and all that. And like just the life of training and skating, I think that was like my first full year off since I had been like. 13 or 14, you know, it was like just a year just to have fun. And uh, I ended up, you know, the next year coming back stronger. So I think <laughs> there was something to that, you know, taking a year off, but not a year off of, you know, getting fat and lazy. It was taking yeah. a year off of uh, just kind of regrouping and seeing if I still wanted to do it, but staying in shape nonetheless. When, uh, when did you personally become i guess what i would call full-time in the team pursuit yeah um we really as a team started hammering the team pursuit a lot in uh 2019 you know 20 2020 we started doing a lot of tp work um you know we got this new strategy and 
we thought we had a strong enough team more than just one team you know we thought we had like four or five guys that we could really have a good strong team with and uh we started really you know hammering that would you say that 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 I guess what I would call the pandemic life, you know, by then you're in Salt Lake City full time as a national team member, right? Um, you know, you guys are all shut in together for months and months and you're just hammering team pursuit. I mean, did, did you feel sort of a rejuvenation for your personal love of the sport at that point? <clears throat> yeah, I'd say the year off really helped with that more than anything. But, you know, being a hockey and lacrosse player for most of my life, I really enjoy team sports. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things about skating is it's all on you. Um, and that's how I kind of grew up skating, like without many teammates at times, you know, it was just like me out there. Um, but that's why I really enjoy the team pursuit is because it we can, like I said, like I had a really – really bad fall of skating on my own but we were still you know able to win two team pursuits because ethan and casey were doing really well and we were able to work as a team yeah. so that's i really like that about the team pursuit um i also like practicing it i like the challenges that come of it and um it's i think it's a really fun event um so so when uh you know, somebody had to make the decision, you know what, we're just going to do this thing where, you know, you get in a specific order and run all eight laps that way. Uh, do you know who came up with that idea? And were you there when that was talked about and tried? Um, I was. It was an idea brought to us. Um, I don't know exactly who that might be a question for our high performance team. Um, but yeah they brought the idea to us and we thought they were crazy and we did it and you know back then it was just like well we're putting you know putting emory in front or putting whoever in front and uh it didn't work great some went better than others and then you know we did one at world championships in salt lake in 2020 and it went really well you know if you looked at our result like I think we skated a 337 or 338 and you looked at that result relative to like the winning time, which is, I think at the time was a 334. And you look at, you know, the personal bests of the skaters that skated that 334 versus our personal bests of the people who skated the 338. And they were, you know, 10, 15 seconds. Their slowest guy was 10 or 15 seconds ahead of our fastest guy <laughs> in the 5k and like com com total combined time they were probably a minute ahead of us in the 5k and you know they were collectively only beat us by i think like three or four seconds in the team pursuit so we were pretty happy about that so what when did it become evident that maybe like casey was the guy to be in front and you in the middle and um that kind of just goes with comfort and what we all think we're best at um you know uh Ethan and I are really good at pushing. Casey's a pretty easy guy to follow. You know, unfortunately, Ethan, you know, Ethan led the one at world championships, but he's got longer legs. So sometimes he, you know, I got a few holes in my skins and in my shins from him kicking me. <laughs> so there's like, there's not like a set in stone. Like if we wanted to put Ethan in front and Casey in second and me in third, we could do that. And I think we would do well, but it's really just like what, position we all feel most comfortable in so people like casey and joey feel most comfortable in front and people like ethan and ian quinn feel most comfortable in back um and you know i could myself i feel most comfortable in second i could also be in third and think i would do well there too yeah so let's uh let's talk a little bit about the 2022 games um you know, I, I think we all have to remember that that crazy 5K at Olympic trials and you getting the the poor draw by not, you know, having a pair that, that could have helped you as much as those guys had. Um, is it fair to say that, 
you might have skated the best out of the three. Is that a, a fair or unfair statement? Um, I don't know. I I don't know if that's fair. I think that. Um, I think that we all skated as fast as we could, and I think it's just a testament to how strong we are as a team that we all yeah. skated within like two or three tenths. Um, that's not the first time or not the last time that Casey and Ethan have been paired together after me. Um, so at this point, you know, it's kind of just an, a running joke between the three of us. <laughs> so when it happened there, it was just kind of like, we, I, we, we kind of just expected that to be honest. So, yeah. um, but no, I don't think that if I was paired with them or they were paired with me or solo, whatever, I don't, I, who knows if it would have gone different, but sure. that's not, the, not the way I would think about it. But is kind of, as far as I know, you ended up skating a 5K and you ended up being the fastest American at the Olympics. Yeah, so Casey had COVID, so he wasn't able to make it to China in time for the 5K. Or right. he didn't have COVID at the time, but he was testing positive for COVID, right. whatever, yep. the, however that went down. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up skating it there. And that was, I think, Ethan's first Olympic race. And the only reason I probably beat him was – he was probably a few more nerves than I did. Um, and that's, that's all I would really say is that, you know, I was, I just probably had a few less nerves than Ethan did. You finished 11th in the 1500. Yep. How does, how does that rank on your list of things that you've done that you're proud of? Um, pretty proud. Um, it's even more proud because uh, my bolt, my front bolt and my left skate came loose on my start, which is really, <laughs> really sad because I always try and I always check my bolts before I go out there and skate, especially before a big race. And like three or four steps off the line, I could feel the bolt poking into the bottom of my foot. And I was like, well, I'm not going to stand up, but we'll see what happens. Um, so luckily, you know, I was able to finish the race pretty much to the best of my abilities. I think if the bolt wasn't loose, I might have, I might have saved a few tenths, but not a whole lot. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that was pretty disappointing. But to have that happen and still finish 11th was pretty, pretty miraculous, pretty cool in my book. So I've known you since 20, we'll say 2017. And certainly early on, you know, when I first got in the sport, I didn't know anything. Um, and, and I think it was fair for me to think of you and look at you always as, oh, you know, that, that distance guy. It seems to me like over the last few years, you've become sportier, certainly in the 1500, but also like, you know, you seem interested in the thousand once in a while. Um, I mean, is that something that's purposefully happened Am I just imagining things? I mean, what's what's your take on that? No, I yeah, the thousand's like one of my favorite races. So I always like skating a thousand, even though I'm not the best at it. But yeah, I definitely am doing my best to gravitate away from the ten thousand and more towards team pursuit, fifteen hundred, and then you know five Ks here and there and thousand meters for fun, even though I don't think I'll ever be super competitive in the thousand but yeah I, I i enjoy doing the shorter stuff and focusing on it more just because the 1500 is more on my radar now you kind of need need to be better you know some of the, most of the best 1500 skaters in the world are also you know top of the line thousand meter skaters so um i don't think i could ever be a top you know top thousand meter skater but it's definitely something that i know that i have to be getting better at if i want my 1500 meter to improve interesting is that something that you talk to with uh with the coaches do you lay out that kind of stuff at the beginning of the year and then there's a plan yeah gabriel and i discuss it and obviously it's not as cut and dry as like well i need to be good at the thousand to be good at the 15 um sure. but it's definitely something that we discuss and definitely things that you know you know, Casey and Ethan definitely see themselves more as 
being better at 5K, 10K, and, you know, they're both really good at the 1,500 too, but I think more from a distance side, and I think I'm good at the 1,500 as well from a distance side, but I can, my top end speed is, you know, just a hair better than them where their endurance is a hair better than mine. Hmm. So that's just something that, you know, Gabriel and I discuss and try and plan ahead for. Well, speaking of that badass team pursuit, I, I want to play a short clip um, and it's, it's only a few corners, so we don't have a, a lot of time here. Um, and, uh, our good friend, um, Kellen Dunphy told me, uh, when we were at, uh, national championships, I think I told you this, that he declared you the, the best team pursuit skater in the history of the sport, which, uh, may be a little hyperbolic, but it's nice to, to have that kind of praise. But when I watch this clip, it, it, what's always interesting when I watch you skate in a TP is I cannot believe how low you are. Um, eight laps of doing 27s and you're just like, I mean, I don't know how you get that low, but it's like you're lost in between these guys, but you have a lot of responsibility. So let's just watch it quick and then we'll talk about it. So when we look at that, you know, what, what strikes me, like I said, aside from you being super low, you know, I, I think generally speaking in your role, you're in contact with Casey pretty much 100% of the time, and I'm sure the amount that you're pushing varies. And then it seems like Ethan is, you know, he lays off a little bit and then he'll come up and put like, just take me through how, uh, how all that takes place. Yeah. Without giving away too many of our secrets here. Okay. Um, yeah, it's definitely something that goes into like, you know, I'm really comfortable behind Casey. So, you know, me having my hand on his back is definitely like a comfort thing for him, you know, because he's the one leading. So, you know, me being that close and being constantly pushing him is just like, a, you know, you're not doing this alone. I'm right here. I'm helping you out. Like, even though you're cutting the air for me, like all that extra air that is not hitting me, I'm putting right into you which goes into me just kind of trying to hide myself behind him. And then, uh, <clears throat> and then, yeah. And then Ethan kind of is our, uh, is our anchor. So he, he really pushes us from the back and gives us a big boost and, uh, helps us out a lot. So yeah, it's just, you know, I just try and tuck behind there and make Casey feel comfortable in front. I feel like that's one of my biggest jobs and, you know, Ethan's job is to make, make both of us feel comfortable in front of him. So, yeah, you know, each spot is hard in its own way, and I think when everybody thinks that their job is not the hardest, or their job is you know one of the easier jobs, and that's when it works like really well. Hmm. Uh, you guys have uh, have certainly molded into something special, and near as I can tell, it it seems like the rest of the world is kind of you know, moving in this direction of picking who's going to be their Casey and Emery and Ethan. Um, cause I just, I see more and more, um, countries just coming out and doing the train and I I'm assuming at some point it's just going to be the standard. Yeah. And it's also, you know, we're also really lucky because, you know, I'm six foot and I think Ethan and Casey are six, two, six, three. So we're fortunate because we're all very similar in body types and not every country has the luxury of having three guys that are within three inches of each other height wise. Yeah. So I think that's another thing that is not something you can fix or do, you know, it's just something that works out well is that we're all the same size and that kind of makes it easier on all three of us to work together. Yeah. It's, it seems so strange to sit here with you. You're, you're 26, right? Yep. Yeah. So you're 26 years old and I'm asking you questions like, you know, what's the rest of your career look like? And, you know, so let's hit some of these kind of, maybe they're sort of trite, but I'm going to ask them anyway. So you kind of look back on your time in the sport so far. Is it easy for you to quickly tell me, one or two or three people that have just really had a huge impact on you? 
Oh man, you know, it's been such a long road. I don't think that would be easy because, you know, I think every coach, every teammate, you know, everyone that I've come across has served a purpose into, you know, making for good, for the good and for the worse of making me who I am and what I can do today. Um, but, you know, yeah, it'd, it'd be really tough to narrow it down to just three people. Okay. Being honest, there's like there's a lot of a lot of credit to be given out there, um, but I think the top of the list would probably be have to be my parents <laughs> because they're the ones that drove me up to the Pettit. They're the ones who have invested all this time and resources into skating. So uh, they would definitely top the list, and then from there, I'd, you know, I'd have to move on to coaches and teammates, and it would be really tough and unfair to narrow that down to only one or two people. So you're a guy that um, I think takes uh, the scholastic side of your life pretty seriously, and I'm assuming that you're thinking about career goals and such that are not going to have anything to do with skating and will have everything to do with some discipline of engineering. Um, do you see yourself staying in touch with the sport, or is it too early to tell at this point? Yeah, I know. It's definitely a sport I want to stay in touch with. Um, I don't know what capacity. I always joke with, you know, all the old timers that are doing the timing in Milwaukee that I can't wait when I'm their age to be timing <laughs> Saturday morning time trials and then going up to the Hall of Fame room and having a beer afterwards. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, you know, in 60 years. But until then, I uh, I would definitely like to be involved. I just am unsure what capacity. Um, you're in grad school now? Yep, I'm uh, getting my structural. I'm getting a master's degree in structural engineering through Johns Hopkins uh, okay. online while I'm out here in Salt Lake. Gotcha. And do you have an end date on that yet? Yeah, I should. If things go according to the plan, I should graduate in the spring of 2024. Okay. Have you had any conversations with anybody about uh, a job yet? Have you interned or? Um, I interned one summer, uh, the summer I took off from training. Um, but other than that, I have a, uh, a sponsor with Collins engineers and they're very generous and, uh, they do a decent amount of, uh, scuba dive engineering for inspections. And that's yeah. definitely something that interests me, but you know, that's, uh, a few years out hopefully. And, but it, they're, they've definitely been very generous and someone I would, you know, look for a career with after skating italy 2026 usa team pursuit uh you on the line i hope so i you know you you never uh you never know in this sport with the ups and downs but that's the hope at this point but it's not you know i've uh i've done three olympics so at this point it's just uh, keep getting faster having fun and passing on any wisdom I might have. I like that. That's a good answer. Um, before I let you go, I'm going to do one more. I don't know if it's really a question. It's a finish this sentence. So I want you to finish this sentence. Before I leave this sport, I would like to what? Ooh. Before I leave this sport, I would like to be satisfied with myself as a speed skater. Yeah. It's that sounds uh, like a good answer. Yeah, it's tough. You know, a lot of people, you know, when you're young or even when you're old, you have expectations of what you think you should be and compare yourself to others and all these things. So the end of the day i'd just like to be happy with what i've done and content that you know that's what that's what it is and not saying what if or what could have been and i think uh that would be a good way to leave hmm. well i'm not going to ask you this question i'm going to make an assumption i i have a feeling you're a good teammate i appreciate that i i try to be you know when i'm when i'm not s skating well i kind of go quiet and shut down a little bit, but, um, you know, I try and try and do my best when I'm, when I'm, uh, when I'm not struggling with my own demons. Yeah. Well, as a casual observer, um, 
I've always been impressed with uh, just watching the way you interact with people, particularly me. I, you've always treated me super good, and um, I, I actually remember the very first time I did a 1500 out in Salt Lake, you were sitting way up in the corner of the stands, and I was excited because I finished, not because it was yeah. any good, but <laughs> but I was kind of coming around trying to get my breath, and I kind of looked up, and you were just like, so yeah. that that meant a lot to me. I actually remembered it. It was kind of cool. Good. So no, I yeah, think you've yeah. been a, I think you've been a credit to the sport, and you've been a credit to U.S. speed skating. And I'm super glad to hear that that you would like to to be a part of the team in 26. So I'd like to see you there. We still got more stuff to accomplish yet this season, yep. and uh, I think you're on the upswing. I I really want to see you on an A podium in the 1500. That's that's what yeah, I would I, like to see. I came close at the end of last year, so uh, hopefully in the next few years here I can sneak onto one. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be that's that, that's definitely up there one of my goals. Cool. All right, brother. I'm gonna shut her down here. It was an excellent session. Thank you for spending the time, and uh, we are out of here. Yeah.